Hey friends, this is the Medicine Stories Podcast, Episode 4. I'm Amber Magnolia Hill, and I'm really glad you're here. Uh, Today's interview is super inspiring and multi-layered. I talk with Asia Suler, an herbalist, writer, and teacher based in North Carolina. Asia's business is called One Willow Apothecaries. You can find her by searching for that term. She has some of the most amazing resources available on her website, online courses, uh, really in-depth blog posts, and a whole lot of just amazing, amazing sources for anyone who's on the plant path or wishes to be. In today's episode, we talk about how Asia's full name is, as she put it, a pretty perfect etymological encapsulation of what I ended up doing with my life. We talk about journaling to ancestral lands and how the ancestors are literally in the land, the fabric of the other world, the limits of our senses, atomic space, the playground of consciousness, and dark matter. We talk about dream visitations from the dead, Angelica, a visionary plant that opens portals of imagination and helps with releasing trauma and coming into our bodies. Reishi as a psychedelic, and the untapped potential of the subtle layers of meaning. Um, Asia's encounter with a creepy dude in the woods, the whole Me Too movement, and how being a nice girl is no longer a good evolutionary strategy for keeping us safe. And then we close by talking about ghost pipe as a tool for releasing ghosts and other things. So I really love this conversation because it kind of goes... In so many directions, um, and the, the triad of plants, well, one is a fungus that we talk about are so powerful, ghost pipe, reishi, and angelica. I'm, I'm thinking someone out there really needs to put together like a killer herbal formula that includes the three. It would be really um, awesome, multi-dimensional medicine. So before we get into this interview, though, I want to talk about a couple other things. One is when when I talk about Angelica, I mentioned very briefly that it is considered bear medicine, and I just want to explain that for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, it comes from the Native American tradition, although I'm very willing to bet that anywhere that bears play a major role in the life of the human inhabitants, um, that, that people there have noticed the herbs that the bears go towards. So the ones most commonly associated with bear medicine and Western herbalism are angelica, osha, and skunk cabbage. And basically, bears love these plants. They seek them out when they emerge from hibernation in the spring, and they dig up the roots and eat them. And uh, there's some really beautiful stories out there about, like there's one about two bears that were in a zoo in Colorado, and they were just kind of like lethargic and unhappy and unhealthy and someone brought them osha roots and it invigorated them and they became playful and even um like flirty with one another so these are just really powerful plants powerful roots osha and angelica i don't really know much about skunk cabbage at all i don't think it grows where i live But so that's what I mean when I talk about bear medicine. And in the second episode of this podcast, Mila Prince and I um, talked, we delved a little bit more into bear lore. There just seems to be like a subset of people who really resonate with bears and with bear medicine, both like physically in the form of those herbs and um, mythically. And Mila and I are two of them. I think a lot of herbalists are, as a lot of people are. So that's what I meant by that. Also, when I'm talking about Angelica or when Asia is talking about Angelica, you can hear me like (sighs) sighing. (laughs) I was really moved by what she was saying. And especially when she was talking about the Sami people of Northern Europe using Angelica stalks as flutes because, and right before that, she talks about Sami drums and, um, I, I am not descended from the Sami, but the Sami and I are descended from the same ancient grandmother. So I found this out through doing um, a DNA test, my mitochondrial DNA, following my pure maternal line, going back, I think it's about 2,000 generations uh, to the last ice age. And I am of haplogroup V, 
which uh, Brian Sykes in his book, The Seven Daughters of Eve, he calls that ancient grandmother from which everyone in my haplogroup is descended, Velda. So Velda is the grandmother of the Sami and of me, and I've always felt a really deep resonance with Northern Europe, although it's not anywhere in my like recent genealogy. I've done the other kind of DNA test, the autosomal DNA, where you get like the percentage breakdown of where your more recent people are from, and there's no Northern Europe for me. And uh, so I was always kind of like, why do I have this resonance with that when it's not there? Um, and then when I got the test results back from from the ancient DNA test, I cried because um, it was really meaningful for me to see that there was there was something there for me. I my people do come from there, but way 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 back, this Northern Europe lineage. So um, haplogroup V is really small. It's like 5% of the population, I think. And in The Seven Daughters of Eve, Brian Syke says that they were the first cave painters. Um, it's just really, really deeply meaningful to me. And so I always am interested in the Sami. And years ago, Asia mentions the Sami drum also. I was at a yard sale in Nevada City, here where I live, and there was this gorgeous drum and I could tell it was really special you know and um so I left it where it was and I walked over to ask the lady how much it was and while I'm standing there waiting to talk to her this guy yells hey how much is this drum and I just immediately got this like super protective feeling and like I don't like to fight with people over things at yard sales or like I don't go to estate sales first thing in the morning anymore because I just hate that energy of being in competition over objects but I just turned around and looked at him and was like, I am standing here waiting to ask her that same question because I really want that. And he was like, okay, okay, you know, you can have it. And so it turned out that it was a Sami drum that like my deep pull towards it really had had meaning. And um, she had got it from them. I don't remember when, a few decades ago. I mean, it's not one of the old ones. Like you look at the old ones online and they're so special, but it's reindeer hide. It's absolutely gorgeous. The um, the stick is a antler piece. And so when Asia was talking about the Sami using the drums and the Angelica flutes, it was just very touching for me. So um, listening back though, when I was listening to my deep sighs, I felt a little embarrassed and I just thought it was kind of funny. Actually, I'm in the last episode with Sophia Rose, I'm definitely a lot too. So that's just probably going to be a part of this podcast. Uh, I wanted to let, speaking of Sophia Rose and the last episode, I wanted to let you know if you are a Patreon supporter, which if you're not, you can be for as little as $2 a month. Um, Sophia and I talked a lot about Datura or Moonflower, and it's not a plant that I know or have ever met in person, but Sophia really enlightened me as to her medicine as a flower essence, and she sent me the flower essence, and the day after I started taking it, I had such an experience with it, and so um, I've recorded a little mp3 download about that experience and that's going up on the patreon feed for um for supporters to listen to uh she says that detura flower essence helps us to give death to those things in our life or those parts of our psyche which are long overdue for dismissal and man that is exactly what happened this little tiny corner of my life that i wasn't really thinking about just became so clear to me the next the next morning after I started taking it that it was time to let go and um, it was hard I was like ugly crying like my lower lip was quivering <laughs> over sadness of having to let this thing go but I had to so that'll be there um patreon.com slash medicine stories also want to give you guys a little preview as to next week's episode because it's going to be pretty different than the last three. So I've had Mila Prince, Sophia Rose, and now Asia Suler on. They're all herbalists. And like I said, though, in the very first 10-minute introductory episode, that's not all this podcast is going to be about. And the next episode is with my friend Carrie Leversey. And Carrie died six days after we recorded it. And she knew she was dying. Um, you know, she knew she was at the very, very end of her life. And she and her husband, Richard, so graciously agreed to come and talk about her experience, their experience together. We Skyped and it's just is so 
powerful, so beautiful. Um, she was microdosing on psilocybin mushrooms. She was, quote, dying out loud on Facebook. Um, she was really just one of those, like, elevated beings who whose spirit grows bigger as they are on their way out, who become this very profound teacher for the people all around them. So I'm really excited to share that interview. I will share photos of the home funeral that they had for Carrie. And we talk about home funerals in that episode too. Uh, so I hope you listen. I, I know it's a departure from like the, I don't know, herbal talk with like the hip herbalist babes, but it's, it's going to be what this podcast is about too. And I, I hope you'll stick with me for those episodes. Um, I thought I would do a little, a little part, a little section of this podcast every now and then called Herb Tip, Herb Tips, something like that. And this time I want to talk about drawing salves um, because I had two, two experiences with drawing salves this week that were pretty powerful. They just worked really quickly for what they were needed to work for. And I thought I would just encourage you to always have some sort of drawing salve on hand. Um, so I use black salve. My friend whose story I'll tell just had like bentonite clay, anything that's going to help draw things out of the skin, out of beneath the surface of the skin. Um, pine pitch salve works really well too. Plantain can be drawing. I really like having a black salve and I just bought one online. You know, you can look on Etsy or anywhere. I don't make them, but a lot of people do. You can make your own, of course. So sometime last week I found that I had a really hard red bump on my chin, but it like wasn't on the surface. It was beneath the surface. Whatever was inflamed and maybe on its way to getting infected was beneath the surface of the skin. You couldn't see anything. It was just a hard red, slightly painful bump. And I don't know what to do. And I thought about putting some black salve on it with a bandaid overnight. And I did that just thinking like, well, whatever this is, maybe this can help draw it out and it won't become whatever it's trying to become. And it just totally worked. Like it was gone the next day. And then a couple of days later, a dear friend texted me a photo. She had a staph infection on her leg. And so first of all, let's be really clear that staph infections can be dangerous. They can go systemic and become sepsis and kill you. That's really serious. But she had had this before. She had experience with staph. She's also an herbalist. And she was watching it and she knew she was watching that red line that comes off of the initial site. So she had like a little red, hard, angry bump and a red line coming off of it. And she had looked up online and drew with pen on her leg like, OK, if the red line gets to this point, then I go to the hospital. But I hadn't gotten to that point yet. So what she did was put bentonite clay on it. I think two or three nights and every day it got better. Every day the red line receded and the bump got less, um, got less. <laughs> so it eventually completely went away. So again, please be smart about staph infections, but also just try to always have some sort of drawing salve, bentonite clay, something on hand because they really come in handy. I've used it like with a splinter before when it's just a little too deep for, for my liking and I'm not quite ready to stick a needle in there. It can help kind of bring it up to the surface. Plenty of uses for drawing salves. So one more thing, kind of a big thing before we get into Sophia's interview. I mean, Asia's interview. And this is something, a synchronicity that came up for me this week that felt really meaningful and felt really uh, relevant to this podcast. So I'm reading uh, Carl Jung's autobiography, Memory, Dreams, and Reflections. I mean, this podcast and all the things that we talk about, like archetypes, dreams, ancestors, yeah, synchronicity, meaning making, really wouldn't exist uh, mythological elements of our lives. I wouldn't have thought about these things if it weren't for the work of Jung, the things, the ideas that he popularized. I was a religious studies major in college, and that's where I first came across him. And just, you know, really honor him as a teacher in my life. And I've never actually read a full one of his books because they seem pretty intimidating. And I thought I'd start with this one. And I think that was a good call. It's a nice introduction to all of his work and his ideas. So the other morning, I sit down to nurse my daughter, and I just open it up to wherever I had stopped last time. And it just happened to be the retelling of this dream that he had. 
And I'm going to read it to you. It's pretty short. And then I'll tell you why it's so meaningful for me and for what I'm trying to do with this show. So he writes, I found myself in a dirty city city. It was night and winter and dark and raining. I was in Liverpool with a number of Swiss, um, Jung with Swiss, say half a dozen. I walked through the dark streets. I had the feeling that there we were coming up from the harbor and that the real city was actually up above on the cliffs. We climbed up there. It reminded me of Basel in Switzerland, where the market is down below and then you go up through the alley of the dead. When we reached the plateau, we found a broad square dimly illuminated by street lights, into which many streets converged. The various quarters of the city were arranged radially around this square. In the center was a round pool, and in the middle of it a small island. While everything round about was obscured by rain, fog, smoke, and dimly lit darkness, the little island blazed with sunlight. On it stood a single tree, a magnolia, in a shower of reddish blossoms. It was as though the tree stood in the sunlight and were at the same time the source of light. My companions commented on the abominable weather and obviously did not see the tree. They spoke of another Swiss who was living in Liverpool and expressed surprise that he should have settled there. I was carried away by the beauty of the flowering tree in the sunlit island and thought, I know very well why he has settled here. Then I awoke. This dream represented my situation at the time. I can still see the grayish-yellow raincoats glistening with the wetness of the rain. Everything was extremely unpleasant, black, and opaque, just as I felt then. But I had had a vision of unearthly beauty, and that was why I was able to live at all. Liverpool is the pool of life. The liver, according to an old view, is the seat of life, that which makes to live. This dream brought with it a sense of finality. I saw that here the goal had been revealed. One could not go beyond the center. The center is the goal, and everything is directed toward that center. Through this dream, I understood that the self is the principle and archetype of orientation and meaning. Therein lies its healing function. For me, this insight signified an approach to the center and therefore to the goal. Out of it emerged a first inkling of my personal myth. So for me, that just encapsulates what I want to explore on the show and how thinking mythically brings us into alignment with our deep self and can help to illuminate our life path. Um, I talked in the very first episode, the brief intro about my middle name being Magnolia. And my real middle name is Marie, but when I was in the womb, my dad called me Magnolia. And as I grew up, he continued to call me that. And so when I was in my 20s, I think I started using it. I go into the whole story in that first short episode. But coming across this passage in Jung's book, of course, felt super meaningful. And not just for me personally, not just like my ego was like, oh, Jung dreamt that the Magnolia was the center of everything or the center of the self symbolically in his dream. But here at the outset of this podcast, it felt extremely um, encouraging and just like a beautiful synchronistic sign from the multiverse or whatever you want to call it, that the focus here on this podcast of encouraging people to keep uh, circumambulating their center. That, that's Jung's phrase, keep circumambulating the center, which means keep like walking around your center, keep, keep circling, keep going there. Um, circum like cir circumference to go around and ambulate, like to walk, to amble. So there's no straight line. There's no like clear A to B path, but we become ever closer to our own center by paying attention to synchronicities such as this and dream images and waking dreamlike states and the visions and fantasies that come to us then um, and the archetypes that we're attracted to the myths and fairy tales that call to us like Sophia said in the last episode we work with plant medicine so that we can become the medicine and we can only become the medicine that we need and that other people need by becoming ourselves, we can only be happy and be a force for good and positive change in the world in such chaotic and uncertain times by becoming ourselves. So all of these, all of these things um, 
the dreams, synchronicities, ancestors, etc. They all contain wisdom that is specific to you. And that's why it's important for you to pay attention to them, to what comes up for you. So in Jung's words, keep circumambulating the center. I hope that every episode of this podcast encourages you, inspires you to do that. And I am quite certain that this episode with Asia Suler will do that. So let's get right into it. Okay, I just re-listened to that intro and I said journaling to ancestral lands. Uh, of course, I meant journeying and that is something that Asia is planning to do soon. But I would add here that journaling is a major practice I know for both she and I and I think every guest I've had so far on, on the podcast. So maybe that's something that we'll have to talk about more in depth sometime in the future. Journaling and maybe journaling to ancestral lands some some sort of like neat mythic writing practice there so okay here we go okay i'm here with asia suler hi asia hey amber i'm so happy to be here with you oh i'm just thrilled to be sitting here in my little room talking to you right now i have a lot of questions. I'm sure we won't get to all of them, but uh, your your output in the world is so rich. There's so much to delve into, so many little concepts and ideas that hook me in and that I want to explore further. So I'm going to start with a really basic but really meaningful question. Uh, when you and I were preparing for this interview, you mentioned to me that your full name, Asia Lee Finnegan Suler, is a, quote, pretty perfect etymological encapsulation of what I ended up doing with my life. So that's like a pretty epic statement. And I would love for you to unpack that statement. Tell me the meaning that your name has for you. And maybe in the process, we'll get a little more uh, of an idea of what it is that you ended up doing with your life. Yeah, well, I'm so excited that you asked me this question, because it's something that I've thought about a lot over the years. And I'm like, people need to know about this. People need to like look into this because I really do believe that uh, there's something really special, of course, about names. And there's something like really poignant about the names that we were given coming into this world, whether or not we decide to keep those names. There's a lot of information there, um, as well as, of course, a lot of information with the names that um, then we receive later in life or that we choose for ourselves. But so my uh, birth name is Asia Lee Finnegan Suler, and I always loved my first name. Like I always really resonated with that name. And a lot of time people will ask me, you know, how did you get that name Asia? And I'm like, I wish I had a really <laughs> amazing story. Um, but really, it just came down to the fact that, you know, my parents just one day the name occurred to them. Uh, my dad actually was writing a book about Western psychology and Eastern philosophy. So Asia was on his brain a lot, I guess. And one day he was just like, how about Asia? And they were like, yeah, let's do that. Um, so that's really the story. Uh, I normally just say my parents were creative people, but, um, <laughs> but when I got older, um, you know, I started looking into the etymology of it and I was really surprised. Cause I think like a lot of people, when I, you know, when I, know the name Asia when I heard the name Asia beyond thinking of myself I think oh the continent of Asia this must somehow be like an eastern name um, but it's actually not so the name Asia um, the, the reason why the continent of Asia is known in the western world as Asia is actually because of the Romans so the name Asia um, goes pretty far back um, I've traced it back to like Mesopotamian roots and it eventually got adopted into Roman culture, and it Asia meant the dawn or the east. Mm. And so the farthest eastern settlement of the Roman Empire was called Asia, and it was in now what we know as, as the continent of Asia. And so that's how the continent in the Western world is known by that name. And so we have Asia, which is like the dawn or the east, and then we have um, Li, uh, so it's L-E-E, -E, and um, Lee means of the meadows and fields. And that comes down uh, more through like uh, Western European traditions. And then Finnegan. And Finnegan is um, obviously coming from Ireland. That's where we know the word Finnegan the most. Finnegan is my mother's last name. And Finnegan means fair one. 
if anyone's ever seen a picture of me, I am quite pale. Um, <laughs> and freckly. <laughs> yeah. And um, pale and, and, you know, proud. I've, <laughs> I've given up on the fact that I probably will never get a serious tan. Um, <laughs> and my last name, Suler, uh, is Polish. It was originally Sulerski, um, which my grandpa changed when he went to the war in part because he was underage and he had to make up a last name. <laughs> um, so he just shortened it to Suler. But in the you know research that I've done into uh, Suler's, beyond it being a town in, in um, Polish last names, the ski is indicative that it's the town of, so it's the town of Suler's. Um, what I've been able to find for the etymology of this word is that Suler actually means student, scholar, and teacher. Mm-hmm. So if you put my whole name together, it's the <laughs> um, fair student scholar scholar and teacher of the meadows of the east (laughs) which is like pretty much exactly like where I live and what I'm doing and what I look like so um yeah the whole (laughs) thing to me I was just like that is some crazy stuff and yeah I think you know on a um, more meta level just the idea that my name would be associated with the dawn and with kind of like new beginnings and new perspectives and new way of seeing feels really important to me in, in what I do with my work. Yeah, I love that concept. Um, I just, you know, changed my name online, my my website and everything from Aquarian Dawn to Mythic Medicine, which feels good, but I, I was a little sad to let go of the word dawn because that's also a concept that I just really, really love. Yeah, beginnings, early morning, uh, Aurora, you know, all these things associated with that word, so meaningful. And I really love that idea of putting all of your names together and seeing what they mean together. I've, I've got to do that for myself. Yeah, yeah, it was cool to see. I was like, wow, everything really does have meaning. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and humans were meaning-making creatures, you know, and the the more you look, the more you find, and the more you find, the more the meaning seems to just fall into your life. And that's mm-hmm. something I really appreciate about uh, what you share, what you write, what you teach is that you're tuned into that and you're you're looking for that. Um, so you mentioned you have Polish and Irish ancestry. And you also mentioned to me that you are going to be going on a trip soon to visit the yeah. town. Is this in, in the States that some of your ancestors lived in? Yeah, no. So, um, yeah, my ancestry is um, English, Irish, Polish and German and the German aspects kind of like the um, between Germany and France region. Um, There's the possibility that there's a little bit of Lithuanian too um, in there wrapped up into the whole more Eastern European package. Have you done um, a DNA test? No, but it's something I'm going to do before I do this trip. So this has been um, something that I've wanted to do for many years and I'm finally getting to a place where uh, I'm, I feel like I'm getting ready to do it. I'm ready to do it. Um, and this is a trip that um, I'm taking to Europe. So I um, have done a lot of geneo- genealogical research to find out the, the places that my family are from. And I was really blessed that actually both sides of my family, unbeknownst to me, different like rogue family members had done a lot of like research into this. So I was bequeathed a pretty great legacy uh, but yeah, so actually visiting the places that my ancestors lived um, in the four places that I mentioned in Europe. And really, my intention um, is just to go and bring my body there mm-hmm. and like just really feel it. And I'm I'm open to what will happen, you know, whether I'll be like, wow, I really feel this or wow, I really don't. Um, either way, I'm just I'm super interested to see, you know, what will happen bringing like my body, my DNA, Mm -hmm. my blood to those places where, you know, this aspect of me, my physical identity was forged. Oh, that's so awesome, Asia. I, I would very much like to do that myself and plan to do it myself at, at some point when the kids are older. Um, I think that there's just so much power there to being in the place. Uh, our mutual friend Mila Prince and I recently taught a couple classes on ancestral herbalism, and we'll be teaching that class again at the Good Medicine Confluence, May 2018 in Colorado. 
And one thing that I talk about during that class is that like the ancestors are in the land and the ancestors are the land. Mm -hmm. Like, like literally their bodies went into the ground and became the earth in the place, in the place where they live, in the place where your ancestors lived. So I think there's so much medicine and magic to making the pilgrimage back to your ancestral lands. And I can't wait to see what comes, what comes out of this for you. I, I assume you'll be sharing it with us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. We'll be sharing along the way. And oh, I love that. I love that point about the land is literally your ancestor. It's so potent and it's so true. Yeah. And it's easy to forget right here, here in America, where unless you are indigenous to this land, your, your, your people aren't in the earth and where we do so much cremation nowadays, it's really easy to forget that for a lot of people, for most of time, like the ancestors and the land were almost synonymous. Mm, love that. Yeah. So, okay. This brings up another question that I have here, which is, I love the concept of the other world. I love that you write and teach so much about it. Uh, you and I both have Celtic ancestry. And in my understanding, that's really the, um, the concept of the other world is very strong there. And mm -hmm. so I would love to hear, I would love you to explain to us what is the other world? Mm. So uh, several years ago, I had this class come through me, Herbs for the Other World. And the reason why it came through me was uh, because I was being asked to really explore and to find what is the other world. Um, it's something that I feel like I've been in connection to for a very long time. And yet when I started looking around and, you know, reading all these different books, specifically, you know, books tied into the Celtic lineage, I feel like the, that definition of the other world felt very nebulous to me. Um, and I was like, okay, well, and this is kind of my process with everything, honestly, is I'm like, okay, I see how other people are describing this thing. Um, how, how would I describe it? in a way that would make sense for me. And it's kind of like this act of um, naming and describing things and writing things uh, and speaking things as well into being is like how I understand things and how I sort of like go deeper and, and cross that threshold. So that's really where this class came from was me wanting to explore the other world and being willing and open to that moving through me in a deeper way. So from my understanding of the other world, uh, and this is this is in alignment with at least part and parcel of what Celtic people have traditionally believed, is that you know the other world is here on Earth. So literally, the other world is a part of this world. It's infused into this world, um, and yet the other world lies just beyond our perception as human beings. So. That said, some people can see into the other world, and there's definitely moments and, of course, times in the wheel of the year where that uh, that distinction becomes blurred, and you can really reach in and, and experience more of this other world. But it's this concept that uh, there is a whole realm of what we would call the unseen that exists interwoven with our reality. So in Celtic way of thinking, you know, this includes the ancestors. This is where the ancestors live here on earth in this other world. When we hear stories about the fairies going into the hills, it's actually a metaphor. So it's um, not just that the fairies are literally going into the, the ground, it's that the fairies are going into another layer of the earth's reality. So I kind of think of the other world as a place where um, what reigns supreme in the experience of reality is consciousness itself. So here in this layer of earth reality that we experience as human beings, it's, it's very physical. And consciousness is a part of that, right? Obviously, consciousness is a part of our experience here, but everything is very physical. It's uh, very embodied. We are subject to, uh, you know, linear time and certain rules of physicality like gravity. Well, in this way of thinking about the other world, um, consciousness actually reigns supreme. So time works in a different way. Um, it's not as linear. It's like ever expanding and contracting. Uh, what rules the show there is not physicality or the rules of physicality. Um, so when we have 
what we consider beings of the other world appear to us, oftentimes like we, our mind is either projecting a form or their consciousness is choosing a form so that we can understand what it is that we're seeing. But ultimately this is a place where, you know, form is not as prevalent and not as important. And this I know is something that's hard for people to wrap their mind around, but you know, you can almost think of it as when you're, loved one passes, um, and moves into this realm of the ancestors, you know, they don't still have the same physical body that they have always had. And a lot of times when a loved one appears to someone in their dreams, they will actually, they can look younger. They can, um, embody an aspect of themselves when they were like truly in their health and their vibrance. Uh, and this is indicative of just the way that, you know, consciousness and non-physicality works in the other world. But what to me is so fascinating about this Celtic concept of the other world, because we see this idea of there being an unseen layer of reality where the ancestors live, where beings of mythology live, sort of these um, beings of the collective consciousness and what you might call, you know, earth spirits, elementals, uh, fairies. We see this in other cultures, but what I find super interesting about at least the way in which uh, the Celtic other world has been passed down and recorded is this awareness that this other world exists here on earth, that it's not like off planet, that it's not in some inaccessible place, that it's actually like literally inside of the bones of the earth here. And in order to access the other world, really, it's just about us sinking deeper into our experience, um, our experience of our own consciousness, our experience as conscious beings, you know, and that in the Celtic way of thinking, the way to like access our deepest and most spiritual experiences here on earth is through embodiment, is through the physical, because that is the gateway that we've been given. Um, so it seems paradoxical, but really that coming even deeper into our bodies and sort of the gateways that we've decided upon experiencing here is what will then give our consciousness sort of this playground and this field to be to connect into the other world. And to me, this really feels like a central truth, like at the, at the center of existence that what makes up experience and reality is so much more, um, of the unseen. And I, there's like a lot of different, um, interesting facts that, uh, back this up. But I think about this one in particular that, you know, because there's so much space in a, in an atom that if we took all the spaces out of all the people in humanity, literally what makes up like the density of our actual matter would fit into the size of an apple. And that apple would like cause a black hole in space and like, you know, have everything collapse upon itself. But really we are more nothingness, no thing, than we are something. Um, and to me, this is indicative of all that space and all of those atoms. That's the other world. And that's really who we are in our essence. So that was kind of a serpentine explanation, but I think kind of the only way to describe the other world is a bit serpentine. And I am, I'm interested always in, uh, finding new language to get us there. And I think kind of sitting in that tradition of the Celtic bard or the Celtic storyteller, this is actually how we move into that experience of this other world is through searching for language. Mm. Yeah. And we know that there's so much we don't see on the color spectrum. There's so much we don't hear sonically. Like science tells us that our limited senses and these little human bodies miss out on so much of what's out there. And hearing your description of the other world, it makes me think about uh, dark matter, <laughs> you know, this mm -hmm. huge percentage of what makes up the universe that we don't know what it is. And it's right here. It's not just out in outer space like we tend to think of it. It's right here, like next to us and in our very bodies. I like to um, think about the other world and dark matter being, <laughs> being the same, if not similar, if not the same things. Um, Absolutely. Your, your words bring up a, a dream that I recently had that I would like to share. Because today is the two year anniversary of my mom's death. And you're, you're speaking about um, having dreams of the ancestors just reminding me of this. And I really feel compared to speak it out and in honor of my mom today. So I had this dream, I guess it was in September because it was the morning of the Pisces full moon. And my mom was a Pisces, and I always just think of her as like the ultimate Pisces. 
super watery and she loved to swim and I love to swim and my daughter loves to swim and I, I, it was really meaningful for me when I woke up and realized that like it was the Pisces full moon. And so in this dream, I came down the stairs in this house and I heard my grandparents' voices. Um, these are on my dad's side and they have both passed also. And I was like, oh my God, grandma and grandpa are here. And then I walked down to the bottom floor and I saw my mom standing there in the kitchen. And yes, she was younger. She was like, she was actually wearing this dress, this white and uh, red floral dress that she always wore in the 90s when she was in her 40s. And she had like the short haircut that she had then too. And um, like I ran up to her and we hugged and it was so sweet and beautiful. And I loved hugging her. And like we pulled apart and looked at each other. And she said something along the lines of, I said, like, I miss you, you know, and she said, mm. I miss you too. Um, this is not what I would have wanted, but we can't know the plan. Mm. Something, something like that, you know, and oh, it was just so, so meaningful to me and so beautiful. And uh, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about it, but I felt compelled to share that when you, when you spoke about that. So yeah, that's beautiful, Amber. <laughs> and I'm so honored to be talking to you on this important day. Yeah, thanks, Asia. I, I never know how to mark this day. You know, it's like, do I just really go inward and like try to feel the feelings and grieve even more than I already do? Or do I try to stay busy? And I thought that talking to you would just kind of be a perfect um, balance of those two things. So uh, you spoke about our bodies, our physical bodies being like the gateway to the other world. And that makes me think about our senses and herbs and the plants that we both engage with as herbalists that so many people nowadays are getting more interested and in engaging with. And so your course, um, Plants for the Other World, is that Herbs for the Other World? Herbs for the Other World, yeah. Wh which I will mention, I saw last night is only $25. Um, <laughs> looks amazing. I'm totally going to do it. And I was wondering if perhaps you could speak on one or more herb for the other world that you have a relationship with? Mm, yeah. So all of those plants that I talk about in that course are plants that are really near and dear to my heart, plants and fungi, I should say. Um, but one I want to talk about because I'm here talking to you, Amber, is Angelica. Mm. And, uh, you know, we both have this connection to Angelica. I did Amber's awesome uh, plant ally quiz uh, on her website. If you haven't done it, definitely go do it. And I got Angelica and I was like, <laughs> so excited about it. Um, this plant has been like coming to me for years so strongly. And I have like such a deep connection with this plant. And, uh, really this plant was like part of what inspired me to, um, to do this course. I harvest Angelica normally in, um, August here in the mountains. There's a spot at higher elevation here where Angelica just thrives in these huge fields. And it's a really sacred spot to me up there. And I go every August and harvest the roots and just the smell, like the smell alone of the roots, it like mm -hmm. literally brings me to the top of that mountain. It's, it's, it's so transporting. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And so I was harvesting those roots and, um, and, and the idea to teach this class herbs for the other world came to me. So they're really intertwined. And I'd love, I love talking about this plant because I feel like what I was um, handed about Angelica was really interesting, but really just like this, like kind of flat picture. And when I started doing, you know, doing my own research and connecting the plant on my own, I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's so much more here. And it's interesting because it, lately I've been seeing a couple of different herbalists talk about this too, like their experience of going deeper with this plant and then being like, oh my gosh, there's so much more. So a lot of people know Angelica or first experienced Angelica um, through Dong Kwai, which is the Angelica sinensis, the Chinese Angelica that like all Chinese herbs is placed through a series of um, processes and curing that directs it towards, you know, certain meridians, certain organs inside of our body. And, uh, you know, Dong Kwai is like this sort of staple herb in Chinese medicine. It's often put in like soup stocks. It's just considered to be this like overall very nourishing and safe herb. And yet uh, it is most often used for 
female bodied people and hormonal imbalances. Uh, so it's used for women going through menopause, women who have uh, longer cycles, uh, specifically oftentimes for women who are experiencing estrogen dominance um, within that. And it's considered to be this uh, like blood mover and blood nourisher. So that was kind of the picture that I was handed of Angelica. And then I started just reading a bunch of other people's take on Angelica and sinking into it. And I realized that, you know, I had been having these really numinous experiences with this herb that I had only really been using to, you know, sort of help fine tune my own cycle and, uh, you know, regulate my cycle, sometimes bring on bleeding when my, you know, menses was coming late. It's an amenagogue, so it will bring on bleeding. And, and yet I was having these really numinous experiences with this plant. And what I realized when I started doing research was that, you know, this plant was really a visionary plant for many peoples across the world. So, you know, from this continent, you know, like all, you know, stretching out really all across the globe. So, you know, for example, reading Matthew Wood's work, I found out, oh, this plant was actually used in sweat lodges here in Native North America, that it was considered to be this plant that opens up the portals of the imagination that actually helps us peer into what you would consider to be the other world, like takes us into this ceremonial space. When I was uh, on the West Coast, when I was uh, with my friend Sylvia Lindstedt, who's an incredible uh, luminous uh, ecological writer, if you haven't heard of her work, definitely check her out, Sylvia Lindstedt. And she was telling me that she had found out through some workshops that she had been doing that this Angelica, which grows along the coast there in spades, was also used as an important smudge for the Pomo people. And so I'm like, wow, okay, this, this plant like really has its legs in many different places. And then I start going over to, you know, European spaces because that's where, you know, I'm from and my ancestor is from. And, you know, I'm finding a similar thing. So much so that, um, you know, the, the Sami of, you know, f far northern regions like northern Finland and um, spaces in Norway, they had two instruments that they used for journeying. Um, one was the drum and one was this flute called a fadno that was made, I found, from the stalks of Angelica. Um, so this plant like really is this actual, is this gatekeeper and I... And I see this plant working in that way for many people on this like uh, more energetic level. And I think its connection with what we know of its connection to the blood uh, has a lot to do with actually reanimating our body and feeling safe to come into embodiment. And if we look at some of the more like esoteric um, quote unquote prescriptions of Angelica and Chinese medicine, we see that, that it's actually this plant for like, moving earth for coming into our bodies for moving releasing trauma and really experiencing embodiment and the blood and invigorating the blood is so central to this so angelica has really helped me move through some pretty traumatic times in my life um you know move through trauma that i had been holding in my pelvis and you know through that really come into my embodiment and therefore my experience of the other world. And I think when I started doing some more research into this, I found, I thought this was super interesting that Angelica is also, um, the flower essence is becoming more and more popular in, um, hospice and an <laughs> end of life care. And to me, like there's something about, you know, obviously this piece of embodiment, but also like being really like, okay, right? Being really, feeling really okay with what is like transpiring in your body, your journey, what your journey has been thus far in your body, um, the way this journey wants to change and really being open to touching into, um, you know, what it is that comes next or what it is that's just on the other side of that veil. Oh, you made me cry. <laughs> well, that's always a good sign. Uh, um, Hearing it was actually it's funny it's the the thing about the Sami using the the um, stock as the flute brought tears to my eyes that's that's so beautiful the um, the stock is hollow and that is a part of you know a part of like that medicine and magic of connecting like the 
the lower realms to the higher realms or whatever terminology you want to use. Um, I'm not someone who loves talking about like higher realms or the higher self. I really like your terminology of the wider self. And I really like the terminology of the deeper self. Um, but a lot of the lore around Angelica that you'll find online is about like higher realms. And I had, as you know, this amazing experience doing your um, intuitive plant medicine. Is that the name of the course? Yeah, intuitive, intuitive plant, plant medicine. medicine course. And I really was so excited to do it because you had said that you were doing guided meditations and I had done a guided meditation with you at the Spirit Weavers Gathering in your stone medicine class in 2015, uh, 16. And it was just incredible. You really brought me somewhere. I'm someone who has like a hard time journeying. You know, my rational mind is just so strong. I'm always trying to get it to shut up for a while. But with your guided meditations, I really get places. And so I had done your, I think it's like finding your plant ally meditation in yeah. your online intuitive plant medicine course. And for some reason, I went into it thinking that I would connect with Hawthorne. Um, it was May and the Hawthorns were blooming and I was just really reconnecting with that tree, especially with that tree in bloom. I had been just in love with that, I think, 10 years before and hadn't really had that much experience in the interim. And so I was like, oh, yeah, like it's going to be me and Hawthorne, you know. So I'm getting deeper into your meditation and I'm finding myself in this like pure white landscape. And I was like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. You know, Hawthorne flowers are white. I'm, I'm going to meet Hawthorne here. But I was like, why is it all white? Like, aren't I supposed to be finding the plant? Shouldn't I be on the earth somewhere? Like, where's all the green? And then it gets to the point where you say like, and now your your plant appears. That's not how you say it, but something like that, you know? And all of a sudden, Angelica just like exploded into my inner visionary landscape. And, you know, the flowers, it's like, um, it's got that umble, it's like a firework almost, of beautiful white flowers. And that's what I saw. And I just immediately started like sobbing. It was so powerful for me. And, and I very much felt that it was connected to my mom and to her passing and to her being in this other realm, the other world. And um, so, yeah, that you just brought Angelica so strongly back into my life with that experience. I had first met her in the High Sierra 10 years ago or something and sat underneath. And I didn't know what the plant was. This was like a, an herb class with Kathy Cavill where we all went up to like six, 7,000 feet and found a plant and sat under it. And I would when I came back and she's like, what did you experience? What did the plant look like? You know? And I was like, it's like this angelic maternal, <laughs> beautiful, beatific being. And of course it was Angelica. And I had a really um, special experience this summer too, when I went back to my hometown, the place I was born and raised, South Lake Tahoe, um, again, you know, Alpine mountain. And I had been thinking like, there has to be Angelica in Tahoe, right? It's like the perfect, the perfect growing conditions for it. The elevation is right. And on the drive up there, it was everywhere, like mm -hmm. whining Highway 50. I was like telling my husband, oh, and I was like, look, there's Angelica, it's everywhere. And the next day, but like that was not a place that I would want to harvest. I actually ended up not harvesting at all. I got a really strong message not to. But I, so I was like, I want to, I want to find it. I want to find somewhere where I can harvest somewhere off the road. And the next day I was driving and my baby had fallen asleep in the car. So I just kept driving and I wound up in the neighborhood I had grown up and I always go back there. It's, you know, always in my dreams and I just, I love it there. So I was driving around and this hillside a couple streets up from my house was just covered, covered in Angelica wow. in bloom. And you know that, I mean, how can you not feel joy when you see that plant in bloom? It's so special. Mm, yeah. So, special is the word. Yeah. It's, it's like next level shit, you know, <laughs> this plant. It's <laughs> so, it's such a gatekeeper. Um, but I went back the next day by myself and I just laid under it, like with my head, the top of my head, like my crown chakra touching the stalk and looking up into the sky and up into the flowers and just talked to my mom. And it was really sweet and really beautiful. And uh, I thought about Angelica as bear medicine. Mm -hmm. And then when I left and I was driving away, I saw a freaking bear. Wow. Oh my gosh. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that plant back into my life. And um, I love hearing that about it being used in hospice. That's, that's really beautiful. And I put some of your Angelica flower essence 
in my rainbow heart beams elixir that I made and came out this month. And it just feels, it feels perfect to have it in there. Oh, that's so wonderful. Even just hearing you like say the name of that elixir, I'm like, oh, my heart just got two times bigger. (laughs) So you mentioned the fungi earlier. Um, You recently published a a wonderful blog post called Psychedelics and the Ecosystem of Meaning, in which you encourage us to, quote, remember that plants and fungi are our kin and our most enduring mind expanders. If ever you need a consciousness shift, they will always be here to help you widen. Uh, Can you talk about your experience with fungi, maybe especially reishi, which you categorize as a psychedelic, which I love because I have had that experience with it? Mm, yeah definitely um oh reishi is another one actually this is an a, one of the um one of the fungi that I cover in herbs for the other world because oh I have just had so many powerful experiences with this being um reishi uh is a lot of people get familiar with reishi through the Chinese reishi um Ganoderma lucidum and, you know, in the Chinese Materia Medica, they talk about this as literally the mushroom of immortality uh, or spirit mushroom that, you know, this idea that you could, if you drink reishi tea or take reishi powder, like literally live forever. But also uh, the other side of that is connecting into the fact that we are immortal, that our spirits, our essences, our souls are actually immortal. And so in this way, you know, reishi kind of connects us into that and and to me, there's a really, um, the, the story of Reishi here where I live really embodies this idea of um, eternal life, not meaning that we never change, um, but actually that we embrace change with every turn and realize that there's an aspect of us that um, is immortal within that. So this, the Reishi that grows here um, in this area is the Ganoderma suge. Uh, which means suge is the scientific name for hemlocks, hemlock trees. And once upon a time here in these mountains, there were two trees that really dominated the landscape. um, And those were chestnuts and hemlocks. And at the turn of the century, the chestnut blight came over um, from overseas, from um, Asia, and decimated the chestnut population here in these mountains. And completely and irrevocably changed the landscape here. Like these chestnut trees were enormous. Like think about, you know, sort of something the size of a quote unquote smaller redwood, like enormous trees. And so the, those trees started to fall. And then what we had left of was the hemlocks in terms of our really big trees. And then recently in the past 30 years, we had this woolly adelgid come over and now the hemlocks are starting to fall and it really is kind of the end of an era here in these mountains of these ancient trees uh, which were you know highly taken care of by the indigenous folks here and these ancient trees which are now falling and completely changing the whole face of our landscape and it's it's a grief you know, it's really emotional. And, and yet what is happening as these trees fall is that the reishi is blooming like never before. Like our woods are just covered in reishi. And, you know, a lot of people harvest reishi because it's this amazing adaptogen. It's an immune tonic. It's a wonderful, wonderful cardiotonic, uh, hepatic, really supportive of our livers, just like an all around amazing tonic for health. Um, and yet what I see to be like the biggest fruit that these mushrooms are giving us mushrooms really being the fruit of the mycelium, this vast unseen network underneath the surface of our soil of our world is this awareness that even when we're faced with death, what we're actually seeing is just a change of form. And I was really struck in particular when I was going to visit this patch of reishi this year that I had seen growing and just really the the place where it was growing was really a powerful portal spot. I was telling a friend that I was going to visit this reishi and instead of saying, I'm going to visit reishi mushrooms or I'm going to visit these old dying hemlocks, what I said was, I'm going to visit a reishi tree. 
And there's something about that just hit me so strongly that I was like, wow, like it really, we're in a moment of really coming to um, being asked to define ourselves, not by what is dying, by what, but by what is like being born from all this death that we're experiencing living in the world at this time. And I think in terms of, you know, the psychedelic aspect, much, you know, Reishi is a, it's a mind expander in Chinese medicine. We call it a Shen expander and you know, there's the big Shen and there's the little Shen. So our little Shen uh, is really our soul embodied and our little Shen lives inside of our heart in Chinese medicine. And it connects us when we have like really good embodiment of our soul inside of our physical selves, we can connect into the greater Shen, what I call our wider self. And to me, like this is sort of the definition of, a psychedelic, like literally Reishi is considered a Shen expander. It expands our consciousness that lives inside of our body and our being. And I think the role of psychedelics in our culture is shifting and changing. We had this, you know, really big, uh, you know, opening with psychedelics in, you know, what you consider mainstream American culture in the sixties. And now what I see us moving towards is actually becoming skilled enough that we can move into the subtles and, you know, indigenous people from across the world have worked with psychedelic plants, of course, what we consider to be these hard psychedelics, but they also work with what we might consider subtle psychedelics. And I think plants and mushrooms in general, they are psychedelics in that they connect us back into what I call this ecosystem of meaning. This idea that we live in a world that is literally like fed on meaning and fed by meaning and that this is as you said part of who we are as human beings is we're meaning makers this is kind of what we do and why we're here and i think just interacting in general with plants and fungi helps us to open our perception to the fact that we don't just live in this human world that we live in many worlds that we live in this like wider experience with many many other different perspectives and consciousnesses and you know, ways of seeing and being. And I think in particular, you know, mushrooms uh, and fungi as like these beings that we're still even trying to understand, like, who are you? What are you? Like, you're not plants. You're actually closer related to animals than you are to plants. Like, how do we wrap our mind around this? Um, They really help us tap into this unseen network that exists underneath our perception. We see this physically with mycelium, but then energetically, you know, I think of connecting into this vast network of consciousness. So if you are interested in working with um, subtle psychedelics, then I really recommend Reishi uh, in particular as just this mind opening, mind altering mushroom that is uh, completely legal and is really helping us to tap back into this place of subtlety. Cause I think this place of subtlety is what we're moving towards. Like we don't need the big and the obvious anymore, right? It's like we we're coming, we're past this, past this point of like awakening that we can really work with the subtle. And there's so many layers in the subtle. There's so many more layers. Like we can uncover what has been subtle to us before Um, And really see that, you know, what has maybe gone unnoticed is just so rich with meaning. Mm, I I love that. I love knowing that about reishi. I, about a year ago, I guess, I got a reishi elixir from uh, another of our mutual friends, Sophia Rose, La Abeja Herbs. And I was taking it and I was like, I'm I'm feeling kind of psychedelic right now. (laughs) This is kind of the feeling you get on mushrooms um wow that's interesting you know I wonder if it's just because like I'm still breastfeeding a baby or somewhat I mean I guess I was like two or three months postpartum at that point or still deep in grief like because I don't know this about reishi I've not you know reishi is not psychedelic and then I opened the plant healer magazine and read your your monograph your your writing on reishi and you said that and I was like oh of course Asia has it dialed in Asia already knew this and <laughs> she's she's letting me know um yeah that's what an important concept subtle psychedelics you know it's if you're really going to do like a a deep psychedelic journey that takes a lot of preparation um mental and emotional fortitude you know integration if you're going to do it properly and it takes a lot of time so we don't all have that time. We don't all have access to these still illegal medicines. 
Um, so I really love the idea of having subtle psychedelics. And, you know, the word psychedelic from the Latin roots comes from psyche, meaning mind or soul, and delos, meaning like to make manifest. So they're mind manifesting or soul manifesting substances. And of course, there's so many more of them out there than just, you know, the ones that we think of the ones that are schedule one, <laughs> um, psilocybin mushrooms and LSD and all the other ones. So thank you for introducing me to that concept. Um, you know, I was even in a float tank yesterday for the first time and in years and it was psychedelic you know mm -hmm. <laughs> really oh absolutely oh, yeah God, it was beautiful and I would love to take some of that reishi elixir before I go in next time I love that idea um so gosh I think maybe my favorite piece of your writing and as you say I think in the first paragraph it, it's a it's a little departure from what you usually share about is a piece called Nice Girls Versus Kind Women. Um, this is just like absolutely a foundational like article for me to have read in my life. And I can't wait to share it with my oldest daughter. She's 11 now. It, she might, it might be time to share it with her now, but certainly in the next year or two. Um, so I'm going to ask you to maybe talk a little bit about that, but I'm specifically interested in in the dream that you had that played a part in the development of that piece? Mm, the dream with my friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, you know, um, this piece, yeah, it is a departure from what I normally write. You know, I normally talk about plants and stones and, um, you know, nature. And I tend to write in a very poetic style, it's just kind of how it flows out of me. Yeah. Can, can and, I say too, that like, it really yeah. went viral, like it went everywhere <laughs> and was, yeah. you know, reposted on different websites and different blogs. And I, it just got so much attention. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the only thing I've ever written that's gone viral like that. And I was like, damn, all right, it's time. Like, like I am not the only one feeling this. And so I wrote this piece, actually, I wrote it um, in the midst of like a really uh, negative experience with a landlord who was uh, an elderly man. And uh, it ju like just the way that I was being treated, I was like, damn, this is this is really messed up. And also what's, what's most messed up about the situation is the way that I am continuing to interact with him, which is, you know, basically letting my boundaries be like completely, um, blown to smithereens because I was continuing to be a nice girl. And, you know, it really hit me literally this whole piece just downloaded to me. And I just like wrote it out in this sort of like passionate, um, space of like emotion and fury, and just really realizing the ways in which I have been, you know, just in culture, just w growing up in this country, in this culture to be a nice girl. And, and, you know, it's, it's important to me that, you know, people feel, you know, respected that I respond with compassion, you know, all of these things. But I started to realize that like nice girls, it, that's not, it's not a compassionate place, right? That like, actually, what would happen if we were raising our children to be kind women? And, it, you know, it made me realize even just by definition, nice girl is something that can only be defined by somebody else, right? Like, you're only nice if someone sees you as being nice. You can in contrast, you can decide to be kind, right? Kind is something you decide to be. And, you know, we look at these old stories of, you know, goddesses, right, from around the world. And goddesses are a lot of things, right? They can be um, intense. They can be savage. They can be wise. Uh, you know, they can be sexual. And they can also be kind, right? But you never see goddesses being nice, like they just wouldn't be nice, right? Like niceness is like this blandness. It's this way of like kind of denaturing ourselves as women. And so what happened then in the midst of writing this piece and in the midst of dealing with this older landlord who I realized was triggering just like years and years and years of me being a nice girl and really getting myself into some pretty scary situations being a nice girl, uh, which really was about like letting myself be walked all over because I was trying to be pleasant 
for other people. Uh, this dream that I had was, um, I had, I had this roommate who was a dear friend of mine who I lived with, um, before I moved down to Appalachia when I was living in New York city. And she is like legitimately one of the sweetest people that I know. And at the time when I was living with her was in a pretty toxic work environment situation where she had a pretty toxic boss and pretty much entirely was inhabiting this nice girl archetype and in, in many ways to keep herself safe. Right. So, you know, I'm not discounting the fact that like this nice girl trope has like literally kept women safe and some of my ancestors safe, um, in the crazy, uh, patriarchal environments that many of us have grown up in anyways. But so she was kind of this emblem, unconscious emblem in my mind of, uh, this sort of, you know, perfect, sweet, nice, um, pleasant girl. And in the dream, we were literally tearing each other apart. Like one of those like mud wrestling, hair pulling, like on like, you know, HBO preview sort of deals of like two women just like literally tearing each other apart. And I have nothing but love for this person. Like she's still like a major friend of my life. Like I absolutely adore her. And yet in this dream, like I was literally tearing her hair out and I, w I woke up like, what in God's name was that? Like, that was crazy. Like, I would never hurt this person in a million years. And what I realized when I sat with this, and I, I do a lot of dream work, and it's important to me to take time to really reflect on my dreams. And when I sat with it, I was like, oh, we were destroying the nice girls inside of one another. Like, we were literally tearing them out of our bodies and destroying them. And it felt so good and so empowering because the truth is when we continue to be nice girls that we stay girls, right? In the eyes of other people, we stay girls, which to me, oftentimes into this culture, you know, means someone who needs to be taken care of, someone who belongs to somebody else, right? And I think when we can bridge out of being nice girls and into kind women, that all changes. And what I realized especially, you know, in that moment dealing with this landlord, but in the blog, I talk about other instances in my life in which this has come up. I realized that actually the best thing that I can do is to be kind because actually calling people out on their bullshit is kindness, right? Like calling people out on like the ways in which they are transgressing boundaries or what they're saying or what they're doing is harassment is a kindness. And I don't think I wrote about this in the piece because, um, it, it happened, I think after I wrote it or maybe I can't remember, but I, um, this was actually in preparation for this, um, for this class that I was teaching called medicine sits in places where I was taking people to this place that, um, really is a, a power spot here in Appalachia where, I consider it to be sort of fairy energy and other world energy is really, really strong. And I had this really powerful journey experience there and I was there alone. I spent a lot of time in nature alone and I was sitting by the river when this man came off the mountain and you know, it's, it's mountain culture here. So it's like, we're friendly, you know, you, you say, Hey, you talk. So he's, he sits down and starts talking to me and starts chain smoking cigarettes and something inside of me, like this alarm bell went off. I was like, something is really wrong here. And, and, I think it was actually after I wrote this piece and I asked myself, I was like, okay, like how, how would, how would a nice girl react to the situation versus how would a kind woman interact with this man? And, you know, my boundaries started getting crossed left and right. You know, he starts asking questions that shouldn't be asked. Like, are you here alone? You know, like what, what is your name? Like, you know, how old are you? And, you know, I, I was like, I'm going to just act like a kind woman. I'm going to see what happens if I really just stand in my power and act like a kind woman with this person. And, um, I answered his questions. Honestly, I was like, yes, I'm here alone. Yes. This is my name. What's your name? How old are you? And finally, you know, he was sort of standing between me and my whole pack of stuff on the bank, which included, you know, I had, I normally carry, you know, like a little, wood knife with me and stuff like that. But so literally I like all I had was my journal and myself in the middle of this river in the middle of nowhere. And, um, finally I told him, I said, you know, I'm going to leave and I start to walk and he starts walking behind me and then, you know, make, make drop some comment about my body and the way that I look and what I was wearing. And, you know, 
every woman, I guarantee you, um, in this country has had an experience like this, whether it was on the street or, um, you know, at a restaurant or whatever. And, and normally what I would have done in the past, first of all, I'm freaking out, right? I'm like, how, like, would anyone hear me if I yelled, like, how can I outrun this person? How far am I from another person right now? Um, And actually what I decided to do was I turned around and like looked at him in the eye instead of in the past, maybe I would have like literally run or just sort of made a weird like laughing comment or, you know, just like shrunk. I turned around and I looked him in the eye and I said to him, you know, what you just said to me is incredibly violating and scary. And like, do you understand what it's like to be a woman out here admittedly alone and to have someone like communicate with you like that and cross your boundaries. And I just really told him how it was and how I felt. And I thought that was the kindest thing I could do. And I did not expect this, but he was so abashed. I think, I don't think he had anyone ever. I don't think anyone had ever done that to him before. Mm -hmm. Any woman ever. He was so abashed. He just like literally shame faced was like, I think I should leave. And I was like, yeah, I think you should leave too. And then he just departed. And, you know, I'm not saying that this is going to be everyone's experience ever, but for me, it was just like such a powerful, like in embodied experience of like, holy shit, like this is what it was like for me to actually be kind. And as he walked away, all I felt towards him was like love. I literally was like, I, I feel really grateful that I was able to actually interact with you from the space of like loving and caring for like who you are and the ways in which like patriarchy patriarchy has like really messed you up and your ability to like relate to people in like a a sacred and compassionate way. And yeah, so it just really hit all that home for me. And I, you know, I can't say that I'm like a complete master, right? I'm constantly working with this still all the time, how to not be a nice girl and how to really be a kind woman. But I think that was one of the first times I really saw myself stepping into this kind woman role Um, in a way that I could relate, you know, pass on to other people and really see that like, no, this actually is potent. This actually, this actually works. And I think that um, we can really begin to bridge out of even this idea that being nice keeps us safe, because what we're finding is that um, oftentimes it really doesn't, right? That it often actually makes us more of a victim. So yeah, this is still an unfolding journey for me. And I just feel really grateful to be on this journey with so many women who are coming to a place where they are just really saying and proclaiming enough is enough. Yes. I, uh, yeah. In light of me too, and everything, all the stories that are coming out right now, um, you're, and the story that you just shared, it really brings us into a conversation that goes a little beyond what, what you wrote in that piece, which is that nice girls are much more likely to be victimized. Um, this, there's a book called The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker that I've read, I don't know, three or four times. I think absolutely every woman, every woman on the planet should read it. Uh, there's so, so much about the story you just shared. So much of his, his teachings I can see, I can see in that story. And one of them is that women are victimized when we are nice, when like the elevator door opens at night in the apartment and you do not like the feeling you get from the man in there, but you're like, oh, I'm not going to be that one. I'm, it would be so rude mm-hmm. of me to just let this elevator door close in his face. Or, you know, the guy approaches you asking if you can, if he can help you with your groceries and you don't like the feeling you get, but you're not going to be rude. You know, he straight up says like, be a bitch, women. Don't, <laughs> don't be afraid of being a bitch. Like, you know, especially when you're still in a safe place, like you, you were alone, you weren't exactly in a safe, safe place, but most women who get victimized, let, let the perpetrator move them from a public Mm. or safe space to a secondary location because they're trying to be nice because they don't want to be rude and they don't want to be the bitch. Um, Another thing that he writes about that your story brings up is the role of intuition. And so he, he gives no hard and fast rules except for don't let a man move you to a secondary location. That's like his only rule because your intuition, he says, will always tell you what, what to do. Like we're, we're animals, you know, and the self-protective um, impulse is super strong. And especially in women now, you know, after thousands of years and patriarchy and everything, everything that's been dredged up to the surface of the collective conscious in the last few months. So for you, the right thing for you to do was to turn to face him and look him in the eyes and say that to him. And that worked. That got rid of him. 
and you you listened to yourself and you knew what to do in other situations that might be to run away or try to grab the knife or whatever but um i i love hearing that you were grounded and empowered in yourself after going through this whole journey of stopping being the nice girl and that it could have really saved you or made a huge difference in that situation yeah absolutely and thank you for bringing that up amber because yeah i think it's so that is so real right that like we've been indoctrinated that nice keeps us safe and you know in this time and era it really does not (laughs) it really really does not and and i think for me Uh, one of the things actually that I was reading at that time was this book by Doreen Virtue called um, Earth Angels, How to Be Loving Instead of Too Nice. (laughs) Um, Or I know, I think it was, yeah, Earth Angels, How to Be, yeah, anyways. Um, But in, and I was like, yeah, I really, and I think to me, like, that's that next step of like, you know, how can I maintain my boundaries, which some people might see as bitchiness, but and then also how can, how can I maintain them with love? Because I think that, and this is where the kind piece comes in. And I've had a lot of people have had a lot of um, reactions to what I've written. And I've definitely had some people being like, you know, well, fuck being nice, you know, fuck being kind, even like, I don't deserve no one, like these people don't deserve kindness, whatever. And then I've also had people be like, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to, whatever it is, like come off as mean, et cetera, et cetera. And I think to me that that middle piece is like, how can we find love? And this is so important as we heal and we recognize that patriarchy has really messed up men. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it really, you know, like it's, it's of course been very damaging for, you know, women and, you know, non-binary folk, but it's also really, really, really done a number on men. And so, how can, you know, with me being really strong in my boundaries, also like really love that person for, you know, who they are and what they've been through and the ways in which they've been really damaged by this culture that we live in too. And being loving doesn't mean that you're being walked all over. Actually being loving starts with being loving most towards yourself and holding the strength of that boundaries. But I think that piece is what really helped me to start to step up into that power. Um, because like many people who are connected to, that blog or my work because I'm, I'm so empathic, right? It's hard to just, when you're so empathic and you're feeling what other people are feeling, that's like part, you're shielding yourself in part when you're being nice, right? So you're, you're shielding yourself when you're stepping away from maybe that moment where you might be considered to being a bitch and you might still be considered a bitch. You know, he might, that guy might be like, wow, that person was kind of a bitch. But, you know, to me, it was like coming from that place of love really helped me actually be even stronger with, setting that boundary. Yeah. And wouldn't you rather some random stranger think you're a bitch than be hurt by him? Absolutely. You know, of yeah. course. Absolutely. Um, another thing that Gavin DeBecker says in that book, The Gift of Fear, is he talks about nice men. And um, he has this line that I've been saying this to my daughter since she was really little, which is that nice is not good. Nice does mm. not mean good. Um, right. Nice is a choice and it's an act. Um, a, a lot of the times, you know, And so I like that you differentiate between nice and kind. And that thing you said that nice is the way other people define us. So, you know, if a a dude is being like super nice to you, that he might just be a kind person or it really might be an act and that he's trying to get something from you and listen to your intuition in those Mm, situations. That's a great point. That That is a really great point. Nice is not good. Um, Yep. I'm glad we went on that tangent. (laughs) (laughs) I feel so strongly about teaching women um, about uh, the realities of, I mean, obviously we all, it's become so clear and it's in all of our faces now, but my story with all that is that, uh, you know, JC Dugard, do you remember her kidnapping story? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to go too deeply into it. People can look online if they're interested. And I've also blogged about it, but um, she lived in South Lake Tahoe. She lived in my town and she lived in my neighborhood and she went to my elementary school. She was a grade older than me when she was kidnapped. And I didn't know her. She had only moved to town a year before, but I, I was friends with a girl who was friends with her. And so, you know, her kidnapping was a huge part of my childhood. Um, you know, my mom was just such an empathic person and she just went full on into like all the activism and the fundraising and everything that everyone was doing. We had her missing posters on our car back windows for years and years. We had the t-shirts and pink ribbon earrings and we just talked about it all the time. You know, I just remember crying with my mom, my mom crying, my mom feeling so much sympathy for JC's mom. 
So when JC was found 18 years later in 2009, after having been kept in her kidnapper's backyard and bearing two of his children, my oldest daughter was three at the time. And I was like, whoa, like, what do I need to know? You know, what do I need Mm. to know to protect her and tell her and what is appropriate to share with her? And what are actually the dangers? You know, because one thing we're really bad at in this culture is accurately assessing danger knowing what we are really, really in danger of dying of, like you're much more likely to die from your bad diet than from a terrorist attack, but people are much more afraid of terrorist attacks than the food they're eating. So that it really brought me into this man's work, Gavin De Becker, and um, I've just been sharing it with people ever since, and it's really been coming up again recently. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad that you allowed me that digression and that our conversation went there because I think it's really important for people, for women, for people who are easily victimized of all genders to to think about and to know those things. So thank you so much for that story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. <laughs> I I think we'll close this out by I'm just going to ask you to maybe talk you recently sent me a really beautiful medicine it is a ghost pipe and carnelian essence Mm. and a ghost pipe I don't think it grows around here I've never seen it it's so beautiful whenever I see photos of it I'm just like (laughs) like, (laughs) oh it's like softens me just to see the image of this this plant and so I was just hoping that you could maybe maybe close us out by speaking a little bit about ghost pipe and the medicine and the, the energetics of it. Yeah, actually, this is a good segue from our topic that we were just talking about. Um, you know, ghost pipe, it, it's this plant that oftentimes people think is a mushroom uh, because it lacks chlorophyll. And the way it operates is it taps into the mycorrhizal network of the forest and it actually receives its nutrients um, from this network. So someone consider it semi-parasitic but it's amazing it rises out of the ground um like almost like this like downward facing crone and uh it's really just such an otherworldly plant and you know i was introduced to the medicine of ghost pipe through sean donahue and sean donahue um is you know an herbalist herbalist up in um, british columbia amazing, amazing herbalist and, um, mystic and magic maker. But he, you know, he started popularizing the, what was, what had gone out of style with this plant had really like sort of fallen out of contemporary materi- materi- medicas. And, um, if we look at the old materi- medicas of ghost pipe, what they talk about is ghost pipe was often used in place of opiates and it was used to actually put the pain beside you to be able to like observe the pain. Um, and like, it's not, like when you use it for pain, physical pain, it's not like you stop feeling the pain, but it's sort of like you can take a step out of it a little bit and just have a little bit of room to breathe so you don't feel as like suffocated by the pain. It was also traditionally used for a lot of things that were associated with possession, like seizures, for example. And it is this uh, plant that's actually, its correspondence within our body um, is our our spine and our nervous system uh, going into our brain. And so really helpful for people who have nerve pain in particular. Um, and then, of course, you know, some of the more neurological conditions, like I mentioned, like uh, having seizures, for example. Um, but what's what to me has become most interested about this interesting about this plant is the way in which it has exploded in popularity mm-hmm. in the past handful of years so much that um, Sean has taken down the post that he originally had about ghost pipe because he's so concerned about the ways in which it's becoming over harvested from the woods. And to me, um, on an energetic level, this plant is about seeing, recognizing and releasing ghosts. And I really appreciate the Chinese medicine concept of ghosts because we, we've kind of Hollywoodized it here in our country. But really, ghosts are anything that haunt you. You know, ghosts are traumas. Um, ghosts can be old relationships. Uh, you know, ghosts are, you know, lineages um, of hurt, right? Like ghosts literally um, are anything that like holds on into our psyche and that haunts us. And we are a country that has a lot of ghosts. I mean, you talk about, you know, a 
11 year old being kidnapped and kept hostage in someone's backyard for 18 years. I mean, this is like, in, this is ghosts, you know, like mm-hmm. pe- pe- people who have ghosts, it's like, you don't do this kind of stuff unless there's a lot of ghosts around. Um, and this way of thinking, which to me is a lot of trauma. Um, you know, knowing that this, you know, country was, you know, a land that was forcibly taken by colonizers, that many, many, many people died in the process, uh, that so many other beings have, you know, experienced major um, decimation and genocide since European colonizers came here. Um, So, you know, obviously indigenous peoples, but also, and, you know, expanding even more so into like the land, just how much, how many plants have been decimated, how many animals, you know, I'm getting a little, this is feeling a little heavy in this moment, but really um, it's important. It's important to recognize that ghosts are actually a part of being alive. And this country, many, many um, ghosts have created through been created through the many traumas. So what I see here with this decimation of ghost pipe is actually that um, we are, it's, it's indicative of how many ghosts we have and um, how much, how much we're really wanting to do this work right now of starting to release this trauma. And so ghost pipe to me, it like takes you on this, um, on this underworld journey of recognizing like, what are my personal ghosts? What are my personal traumas? Like, what are the things that like drag me, um, into the deep, deep dark and, and seeing that, that it's actually a gift to go there. So this medicine ghost pipe and carnelian, um, the, the ghost pipe in it is made from a flower essence, which at this point in time, I really only recommend working with flower essences of ghost pipe and ideally finding someone who's already made a flower essence, um, because this plant is so over harvested, Uh, And I, you know, I made this flower essence probably four or five years ago. We actually still have pretty healthy populations of ghost pipe here um, in where I live, but still I, you know, I don't recommend harvesting it. Um, It's physical medicine, but as an energetic medicine, I find it's really powerful. It's specifically powerful for, you know, releasing trauma. I work with it with clients who are experiencing PTSD, sometimes who experience sort of like out of um, body stress responses And it really helps us to like, when we're going through a really painful time, like put that pain just beyond us so we can look at it, so we can really see it, so we can have this wider perspective. And so I made this medicine ghost pipe and carnelian, um, carnelian actually being a stone in the Chinese materia medica that's all about ghosts and releasing ghosts. I made this medicine when I was going through a really hard time, when I was going through a really sad breakup and... I was just going down into the dark, dark depths and I was sitting with ghost pipe and it was almost like Carnelian like walked onto the stage and I was like, Oh my gosh, you two want to be together. And then I worked with this medicine, you know, during this entire autumn season where really this relationship was dissolving and um, it really helped me not be resistant to the journey. And I think that's something we're very resistant to sometimes with uh, depression, um, you know, going through hard times, really examining trauma is we're resistant to going there because we feel like we need to always be happy. We always need to always be, you know, someone asks you how you're doing at the grocery store. You're like, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, but really we need to go there. That's actually how these things are released. And I see this now, you know, in our, in our culture, in this country, right? Like we, we need to go there. Like we're, we're talking about things like, yeah, sexual harassment in um, you know, the film industry, like we need to go there talking about, you know, last year, I feel like when standing rock was, um, so prominent in the public imagination, like talking about the genocide of native peoples in this country, we need to go there, you know, and the way in which that genocide was tied, tied into the many genocides that happened to other beings that were living here in this land. We need to go there. And I think that this medicine ghost piping carnelian helps you when you are feeling that call into the underworld journey to like know that it's okay to go there and that you have so many beings who are here supporting you, helping you to move through that. And that that's actually like the greatest gift you can give this world is to do that personal work that that on a very real and very holographic level actually is healing the whole for you to do that for yourself. Mm. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, Asia, I'm just like 
in a very expanded state of consciousness right now. <laughs> yeah, Speaking yeah. slowly, feeling dreamy, really appreciate your story medicine and so grateful to you for being here. Um, I would like you to really close by speaking about where people can find you online. And I am especially curious if your intuitive plant medicine course will be available again coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would love to connect with any and all of you online. Um, one of my favorite things is connecting to folks online. So I have a website. My website is one willow apothecaries, O N E spelled out. And I also have different ways that I share online. So I have a YouTube channel that's actually Asia Suler YouTube, my name, which now you're uber familiar with after <laughs> the first question of this interview. Um, and so you can find my YouTube channel there. I also share on my blog, which is called Wool Gathering and Wild Crafting, which is uh, on my website. And I have an Instagram and a Facebook, and that's are both under One Willow Apothecaries. And I share a lot of my writings and gleanings there. And yes, Intuitive Plant Medicine is going to open back up for enrollment this spring. Um, it is like a closed container journey. So uh, you know, we start at a specific time. We start on Beltane, May 1st, and we travel as a group together through the eight weeks of the modules. And I'm intimately involved with the whole process. Um, so that will open back up for enrollment again in April. Awesome. I couldn't re recommend it anymore. It was really powerful for me. And um, I know a few other people for whom it was also just a big like initiator onto their plant medicine path. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amber. This has been so wonderful to talk with you here today, like so deep and so rich. I appreciate you incredibly. Yeah, back at you <laughs> a thousand times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the medicine you bring. And let's do this again sometime. Yes, I would love that. Okay, bye. Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, handmade herbal medicines, and a lot more at mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, be sure to click the black banner across the top of the page to take my quiz, which magical herb is your spirit plant? It's a fun and lighthearted quiz, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with the medicine that you're in need of. If you love the show, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash medicine stories. Um, there's some cool rewards there, like exclusive content, free access to my herbal ebook and online course, and the ability to chat with me. I am a crazy busy and overwhelmed mom and adding another project into my life with this podcast is a questionable move, but I'm also so excited about it and just praying that the Patreon will allow me the financial wiggle room to keep doing it. Another way that you can support if that's not an option is to head over to iTunes and subscribe and review the podcast. That would be super helpful. Thank you. And thank you to Marie Sue for providing the music that I use. That's Marie with two E's, S-I-O-U-X. This is from her song, Wild Eyes, one of my favorites. Uh, check out Marie Sue. Beautiful music. Thank you, and I look forward to next time. Bye.